Hello world. Nice to see ya. Hear ya. Uh, sense your presence. What are we doing here? I don't know. Sure feels like I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> but I felt compelled to talk to myself out loud into a microphone today. So I'm just following those instincts right now. Um, yeah, it's been a hard couple months and I, and I know all of my close friends, everyone I know is, is really just going through the shit, uh, health problems and family deaths and, uh, yeah, really serious health problems and it, all kinds of shenanigans. I don't even know where to start, but since we're all in the shit together, you know, and I, and I, I sense this trend, um, I, I felt that I wanted to just break the silence for a minute and do a little solo episode about what I'm struggling with, uh, mostly so that it could be of use to you. Uh, that's what I feel like I can offer the most, is really just uh, a look at my life and what it looks like for a real dedicated artist uh, in the world, what that looks like, because I don't think there's a lot of us out there. Um, and if there are a lot of you out there, you need to get in touch with me immediately. <laughs> I've been looking for you. Anyway, I wanted to talk about breaking up with someone you never met before. And I, it's so strange because I find that I'm doing just that in a handful of these remote relationships uh, that, you know, we all are, have gotten accustomed to now, you know, where you, I've never met the people live in person before. And in some cases, they don't even know my name. But there's about three of these relationships that have kind of run their course recently. And it's just been so painful and confusing. And I just wanted to, uh, yeah, kind of process it with y'all. Because it's such a new phenomenon, like these remote ways of coming together. And it's been so hard to connect during covid so I really had put absolutely no thought into what happens when you have to end one of these relationships, you know? And one of the most painful ones that I'm going through is with someone I, I have come to consider my spiritual teacher. And that's so weird because really, he just runs a podcast that I've listened to it. And I've listened to it for a long time. I've listened since 2017. And I've been taking, you know, his, I've been part of his membership, you know, for a while and take his self-led online classes in magic, you know, and these are kind of self-led or you do them, you know, when they come out, but you can do them in your own time, you know, how the deal, all, all the things, but he doesn't know me. He doesn't know my name. And so he doesn't even know that we're breaking up, you know? <laughs> and so calling him my teacher really is just such a stretch, right? But Yet that's how he's influenced my life. And that is the role that he's been filling in my life for about the past four years. Yeah, leaving him and <laughs> deciding to, uh, yeah, just move on has been, I don't know, fraught with all kinds of uh, anguish for me. And, you know, it's hard to know how much of it is just what's in the air right now, I know I have just been feeling so low and it's been hard for me to, to know, you know, the struggle has been so real for me since 2015, since my whole life fell apart. So, you know, it's hard for me to even pinpoint when it, or if ever depression has ever fully left, <laughs> you know, and that might be surprising for some of you to hear because I have a generally sunny disposition which is courtesy of my Ascendant and my Mercury and a couple other placements that I have in the Venus-ruled sign of Libra. And, you know, Venus, the lady of love, she is concerned with pleasure, with beauty, with our relationships. And Libra is, you know, that's the part of me, that's why I'm such a romantic. It's why I'm a snappy dresser, you know, expressing myself through adornment and all that stuff. And it's also why I'm very attuned to balance and fairness in the world. But, you know, it's the other stellium that I have in my chart, a bunch of plants that I have in Scorpio, that makes me an artist with a capital A. Because Scorpios are the investigators. We are the deep diving sort, along with the other water signs, Pisces and Cancer. But Scorpio is a fixed sign, 
whereas Pisces is cardinal, so they're like the starters and initiators, and Cancer is mutable, they're very changeable, um, and Scorpios, being a fixed sign, we hold the center, sort of work with what's available. But really that's only after like a, a very deep investigation of the durability of the materials. You know, we don't like to build on weak foundations. We tend to turn over every rock and kind of like shake the foundations often to see if they're gonna hold. And that process of shaking foundations, I know it sometimes seems counterintuitive and definitely scares the shit out of people. You know, because when you're trying to finish building something, sometimes you just have to get the damn thing done and you can test it later, right? Sometimes that's the way you got to do it. But for anything that really matters, like rebuilding my life, rebuilding my career, or building this new studio, or renovating the RV that I live in, uh, you know, I'm running around doing a lot of foundation shaking to see if my work is worth it, to see if all these things are really going to hold up to the test of time. Can I trust this? Will it withstand life happening to it? One way this shows up in my life is that um, I think about this a lot because it's sort of a weird thing that I do, but frequently I, I just machine wash my favorite sweaters, even when they say dry clean only, knowing that I might lose the sweater in the long run. But I don't live a dry clean only kind of a life. I am a wash and wear kind of a gal. So even if I do buy a great sweater, which is, you know, one reason I buy them mostly at the thrift store, I'll wear it till it's dirty, and then eventually I'll have to make a decision. Do I set this sweater aside in the dry clean only pile? Because if I have to dry clean it, it basically means getting rid of it. Because what's going to happen is that it's going to sit there in a bag by the door for six months. Because I'm never going to prioritize driving way out of my way to spend a whole bunch of money to have people put toxic chemicals on a sweater that I just want to wash in the machine in the first place. So then the bag will sit there forever and then I have to make the same decision then. Do I put it again in the dry clean only pile? Or am I going to just wash the sweater and see what happens? And because I've gone through this dry cleaning ritual so many times, now I just wash the sweater. And, you know, about 25, 30% of the time, the sweater gets fucked up. It's like shrunk, gets all like misshapen, and I have to say goodbye to the sweater. But 70% of the time, the sweaters are totally fine. That dry clean only is bullshit. I get to keep wearing the sweater. I get to keep them clean as I want to, and I'm way happier because I have a not-so-precious and much more practical sweater that I can wear all the time. So, you know, it's one way of doing things. I'm, I'm not saying it's the right way, but just giving you a little glimpse into my life. That's all I promise, people. But I really feel that us Scorpios get a bad rap. It's really thankless work. On the one hand, I get it. No one likes having their sweaters shrunk or having their foundations shaken. It is disruptive and inconvenient. It, it exposes cracks and weaknesses, and these are the things that we're usually trying to hide, right? But on the other hand, what stands the test of time is going to be shaken to its foundations by way more destructive forces than me. So isn't it more beneficial to pay attention to the small cracks now? before they cause the whole dam to break. I mean, a short-term inconvenience often prevents long-term disaster. So that keeps me busy. You know, I have a, <laughs> avoiding the long laundry list of mistakes that I've made so far in my life as I'm trying to rebuild, that keeps me really, really busy. Believe me, I am testing the strength and weakness of my new life all the time. I am constantly looking to see if it is going to hold to see if it will carry me further, if I, it will provide more protection, be more beautiful. Is it, you know, do it better and different and, and more secure than I did before? Because we're always growing, right? And my expectations are growing with that. My ability grows with that too. And, you know, Scorpios, we are thorough. We are passionate to the point of obsessive if we aren't careful, and, you know, but also that's all signs. There's like a little equalizer fader on every sign that goes between benefit on one hand and detriment on the other. And it's always 
kind of sliding back and forth, you know, none of it's ever perfectly in balance. We try for that. That's the goal. But it's not always up to us. And But, you know, none of the signs are all good or all bad. All that said, I just feel like you can really trust a Scorpio to tell you the truth, you know, which I think is a great gift because the truth carries the light with it and it makes the way clear. And even when you feel trapped in the darkness, you know, with clarity, you're able to see where you're going and to know where to take the next step. So given my propensity for foundation shaking and <laughs> dry clean only sweater washing, this can also sort of like, it goes into this other realm of, of uh, Scorpio nature, which, you know, can be described as poking at taboos. And, and that, I think, is really what being an artist is, a professional poker of taboos. I looked up this word, and this I learned some things, always with the dictionary, it's so great. Taboo is, a, in English, it's an adjective, a noun, and a verb. However, it has equivalent words in Polynesian languages, uh, which are only adjectives, which I thought was interesting. So the adjective version is prescribed by society as improper or unacceptable, prohibited or excluded from use or practice. The noun version, uh, prohibition or interdiction of anything, exclusion from use or practice, System, practice, or act whereby things are set apart as sacred, forbidden for general use, or placed under a prohibition or interdiction. And the verb version, to put under a taboo, to prohibit or for forbid, to ostracize. And there was a story in there about Captain James Cook, who used the word, he used T-A-B-O-O -O and T-A-B-U, both spellings, and he described it as a word of a very comprehensive meaning, but which in general signifies forbidden. So, and then it says that T-A-B-U is also the variant in some other Polynesian languages of Melanesia and Micronesia. In Maori, which is uh, the language, the native language in New Zealand, the form is tapu, T-A-P-U, which is also reconstructed Proto-Polynesian, and the Hawaiian has a variant Kapu, K-A-P-U, which I, yeah, just interesting thinking about that word, taboo. So the forbidden is like the underbelly, right? This is the underside of things often, and, you know, what we're not allowed to do. And that's always, you know, when you're a kid, Right, where you know to go. I mean, that's, yeah, that's what we want to know about. That's the good stuff, right? That's the sex and drugs and rock and roll part. It's, you know, but when we talk about it being the underside of things or the underground, that's also where the creepy crawly things live. And that is the dirt. That's where the shit of life is composted. And that is what allows for beautiful things to grow. So, and that is very much my domain. You know, you have to be able to withstand the shit in the underground, <laughs> you know? It's like uh, I was part of an underground bohemian sub subculture. That has been my domain. It's like the that's the place that you go where people work out the sort of shadow material in the whole culture, right? The strip clubs, the dance floors, the, the all the CD festivals and music festivals and, yeah, all that stuff being part of the bohemian underground subculture of performing and cabaret and circus and burlesque in Baltimore and New York and traveling the world, doing all these things, you know, that's, that's the world that I'm talking about, that, that I, I've done the most of my work. And back then, you know, I really felt that there were a lot of fragile girls complaining about not feeling safe in these underground CD cabarets at the time in New York, you know, they, and I felt like they, if they couldn't take the heat, they should, should probably get out of the kitchen. It really seemed like they were just trying to create, they kept calling it a safe space and really just trying to remove any perceived offense so they could sit around and I don't know, just enforce all of their 
fucking rules while preening in mirrors and parroting each other. Literally, it was the most unimaginative um, sort of scene I, had, I could, could imagine. You know, I mean, that happens. I think that happens every generation. The one, it's like whoever is coming in next, they're only going to see what you've created. And just by nature, they're going to try to do the opposite thing and explore the opposite thing. So, you know, of course, it's going to make me a little prickly when, when the next wave was coming in and we don't share values because they're literally choosing opposite values of everything that was important to me. I get it. I've been there. I was that rebellious girl myself once. But the job of real artists is to still carry the torch. You got to take the best and forget the rest, you know? So if what they had brought in would have been better, I, I probably would have adopted a lot more of that philosophy. However, I found that philosophy very regressive. It didn't make things more free. It made things more constricted. And the nature of our work was very much tied to freedom. Freedom of expression, freedom of sexuality, freedom of thought and ideas. And yeah, just real freedom to be different in the world. And I never did any of this to feel good about myself, you know, because for me, being an artist was, wasn't really a choice. It's a compulsion. I, I didn't really have a choice. Joseph Campbell talks about following your bliss, and I really have done that, you know, but, and it's true, I follow it. I'm not leading it, and, you know, it's not fun, and it's not always easy, and it's not always, it really doesn't always feel good. It's terrifying, and sometimes the stakes are really high. I've lost a lot. You know, but I've dedicated my life to living my truth and walking an unconventional path, and there is no other way. So it's like I take my lumps with that. And in that regard, you know, over time, as you overcome so many fears in yourself, and really, I mean, the lit laundry list of the really long list of fears that I have had to overcome, to, whether it's fear of heights, doing circus things, uh, you know, fear of performing in front of people, fear of being naked outside, fear of, yeah, my parents finding out, you know, like, you name it, all the fears. And it, now I know that the fear is where the transformation happens. I, it, it's just like improv. You have to chase the fear because life is an improvisation. It is coming for you one way or the other, so you might as well walk up to it and say, yes, and <laughs> instead of saying no, but I'm a yes and kind of gal. And one person walking their talk that way, it starts to shape and temper the material world. It starts making a little more space for other people to also do that same thing. And I've done this. Uh, my whole adult life, and I've seen the, my my influence a little bit in the world, and I know that m embodying it, me embodying freedom and sticking to it and walking this path, it gets into my muscles and my marrow in a very very real way, right? Like this is, it's not just idea an idea, it's not a book I read. This is now who I am. It's how I move in the world. And I've said this a lot lately. I, I'm, I'm dog sitting. I have another dog with me. That's, you'll hear Jasmine in the background. We had our first trip to the river today. My first skinny dip in the old Yuba River on May 19th, 2021. It was great. Anyway, so I've been talking about this a lot lately. Um, partly because of working out at the marijuana farm. We've been doing months of work soil preparing the soil for the new season. And it's just, it's incredible how much work goes into preparing the soil. But when I think about the underground and the fact that culture is the soil in which our consciousness grows. The root of the word culture means soil cultivation and adoration. 
And I just keep talking about this over and over lately because it's just the metaphor for what I think we need to do is really build the underground. You know, it's, it's the only way the beautiful things can grow is to compost the shit and turn it into something really beautiful. Our culture is incredibly sick. It has been for a long time. You know, uh, I talk about my canceling kind of as uh, uh, this thing that happened. It was like the before I was canceled and after because my life and reputation was destroyed. Speaking up against all of the constriction that I'm talking about that was seeping into the subculture years ago, going on six years now. It's when I first started talking about this stuff. And that was a scene that I had given my soul to for f over 15 years, reviving it from almost nothing. There, there wasn't really much of a scene when I got into it. You know, I cared a lot about the scene. I cared a lot about the art form cabaret, which, you know, my little corner of it was mostly in the burlesque and circus worlds. But I was so scared by the cracks in the foundations that I saw, I risked speaking my mind. And I knew I wouldn't be able to go to that, back to that community. So I knew that it was kind of like the end. But what I didn't know was that that community would, I didn't even know they even could, but I really didn't think that they would, then turn on me and attack me so badly for speaking what I saw as the truth that I would then lose a probably 90% of the friendships that I had and that it would take me over five years to even begin recovering from the damage to my life. So, you know, my belief in, in, in the type of expression and freedom that was once embodied in the cabaret scene in New York was so strong, I risked my own personal discomfort to protect it. And that's the Libra in me. The taboo pushing, though, is all Scorpio. Speaking up for truth, Libra. Pushing all the buttons of people to piss them off, Scorpio. But my deeply held belief in um, just how valuable foundation sh shaking and sweater washing and taboo poking are collided, right, with the dominant culture's obsession with safe spaces and all that stuff. And that I caused a forest fire. To me, it was just very ironic to be trying to create a quote unquote safe space in the exact same spot where radical, messy acts of taboo poking are actually supposed to be performed. So I became a staunch protector of what I called the unsafe spaces. And I still am. I, I literally, I've been trying to remake a, an unsafe space <laughs> in my own way since I left New York. And it has been hard for so many reasons, which I bitch about all the time. But I'm saying all this now with a lot more fatigue but with the same amount of urgency that I had before. Because our culture is sick and the soil is contaminated. It doesn't have any organic microbes. The nutrients are artificial and you can't grow very much aside from an online coaching business apparently right now. And from my experience, real artists can't really even find any ways in to connect to communities because we don't make community anymore. It's like the streams and channels are all controlled by pay to play corporate capitalist companies. And I've been saying this so long, I'm actually, I'm sick of talking about it. I feel like everyone knows how I feel about it. And I feel like my words aren't reaching any more new ears anyway, because I don't play well with the algorithms. People don't value information more than lived experience. And I, I mean, I wonder about the futility of everything I do all the time. And especially, you know, I believe in images more anyway, but the, the, the world does not value the same things that I value. And I'm a, belie I'm a woman who walks my talk more than I talk about it. <laughs> but I'm forcing myself to talk about it. 
you know, it's like I have I have this thing in my bones that um, has oriented me to a truer way of being and experiencing the world that I think is is a lot healthier for myself, the planet, and everyone around me. So I, it's why I'm forcing myself to uh, articulate. Yeah, just what's in my bones now at this point. Uh, it's like I have a, a ton I want to say, you know, but I like the definition of wisdom as the combination of knowledge and experience, right? You have to learn about it abstractly and put it into practice. And I've been walking my talk for decades, as I mentioned. I have all this Scorpio in my chart. I'm very thorough. I have a lot of hard-earned wisdom that would probably be really useful for folks. But I don't know. We're, it's like I don't know where to have these sort of complex layered discussions that actually don't even have any answers, really. But, you know, the culture is definitely not feeding us right now. Uh, or if it is, it's not feeding us anything nourishing that could actually be transforming the shit of humanity into the fertilizer that makes our souls bloom. And the heartbreak I have about getting to the limit of, like with my own spiritual teacher, just to bring it back to that, it's just been gutting me. It's it. I've been so torn up about it. I mean, I think it's like a, a big part of my uh, depression right now. And... My disappointment really surprised me. It caught me off guard even, partly because I really didn't think of him as a teacher until I was trying to figure out why I was angry. I mean, he I just listened to his podcast and I became a member and I took a bunch of his on, online classes. I was part of the things. I learned a lot of stuff. But this last course, I got lost. And I... I, it was, I couldn't tell if it was me. I started to feel like I couldn't just, I, uh, like I couldn't take in any more information online. So I started to think that maybe this was like a COVID side effect, you know, of living my whole life online for over a year. You know, could I, am I just at my limit with online information? That seemed possible. And then I was like, or maybe it's the subject matter just doesn't resonate. You know, maybe I just need to study something different. Or maybe I thought for a while it was just my memories finally going, either old age, weed smoking, I don't know what it is. So I spent uh, several weeks just feeling that the problem was me. And I, to compensate for this, basically dove into all the other suggested materials. Like, I was like, okay, well, let me, let me try to learn more, go deeper, try harder. I ordered books, I went back, I rewatched a 12 hour course. Um, just to get the context of the first course. And I watched that 12 hour course three times before I went back to the first course and watched that another two times. And then after that, I was still so lost and I got really fucking mad. And then I felt like he was an irresponsible teacher. And then I spent a few weeks thinking about teachers and what I can reasonably expect from a teacher on the internet. And I was like, yeah, right. Like, this is just a well-intentioned person with a very specific passion that they share with others for a small cost that supports them in their life. That's great. Of course I love that. Of course I want to support that. That's no harm in that. It's all great. And I couldn't expect like the kind of initiation into a sacred tradition the way that I got with my yoga training. I mean, that was – they don't even do things like that anymore in yoga, really, what I got. I've been burned so bad trying to learn how to be a witch on the internet before. So I knew that, you know, some ways to learn are better than others. But I did spend those weeks thinking about the times I've been a teacher. First, right out of college, I was a teacher to inner city kids who lived right around the Baltimore City prison. And I, you know, I worked with them for like six or seven years, taught them how to paint murals, how to grow vegetables and I led them in starting a student-run business, selling plant and vegetable seedlings. And after, after teaching myself and grilling a few professionals, I also went on to teach people how to do synchronized swimming. 
and how to perform a stylized type of narrative water dancing in public parks, which I, I pioneered for a long time. And then I went to circus school. I taught yoga and hula hooping for a while. Oh, just to go back. So when I worked with the city kids, and this is an important point because I think about this in my teaching sometimes. I worked with such a, um, they're called an at-risk at population, you know, and that's why I worked with them, right? I, I went right to the problem in Baltimore City. The kids living in total poverty in, in one of the worst neighborhoods, one of the most violent, worst neighborhoods in a very uh, troubled city. You know, I, I went right in there for many years, but you burn out. You know, and you can't fight the battle the same way anymore. And I was also too codependent and and way too hung up in them and got real involved in all their lives and knew their parents and had, had them doing shows, all kinds of stuff, you know. And I think about that with teachers all the time because I, I don't know if you should have that job forever with very challenged kids because it, you know, I started to just not like kids is what happened because the problems were too big and my ability to have any impact was – Times tiny, small, and really, you don't know how you impact kids, except over time. Maybe now they could tell me, but anyway, I was then, you know, in Baltimore for a while. Then I went to circus school in Vermont, and I was teaching yoga and hula hooping for a bit. But then I was doing so much traveling, and I was told, you know, that I was too much of an inconsistent teacher for any studio. So I kind of gave up doing that, but I was fed so much. I mean, I was basically the Peace Corps of, of burlesque, like bringing it to the people <laughs> for years. And then, you know, when my burlesque peers began monetizing the art form that we were sort of like really pioneering together, I got really mad again. They just leaned into this dance school model, but it's just – so lame to me. It was just like eight week classes and then you get a student recital or a show at the end and then congratulations, you're on your way. And I just hated this model really deeply because I just thought it dumbed down the art form and it turned basically what was an art form into a self-help workshop for a bunch of people to just feel good about themselves. And like I said, that has never been the point. Art comes first before your ego, before your fucking feelings. It's a service job basically. And one in which is very thankless, like I said, because people don't even understand what you're doing and how you feed them all the time without a any acknowledgement. They don't, like I said, they don't even see it. So the whole time I was in New York, I still practiced yoga <clears throat> religiously. And I secretly just kept hoping that if I made relationships with a symbiotic studio, they would, of course, want to hire me. You know, someone with such good experience and my practice was consistent over, you know, at that point, more than a decade. And it was, that was also in my bones. I just felt like it was undeniable, you know. But every studio I got into relationships with, they, they were all turned out to be closed systems. It was all pay to play. You know, you pay to, you pay to learn their style in order to teach in their studio. And that's it. And I just started to resent that. You know, it's like I had spent years wrestling with my ethical character, wondering if I was even um, a, like a, a devout, uh, good enough person to be a teacher, following the yamas and niyamas, which are the do's and don'ts, really just like on a daily basis, like assessing my um, – my pursuit of a spiritual life. I continued my spiritual study and devotion through all sorts of storms, you know, and it, and none of that mattered as if, if I could just pay thousands of dollars to a studio, <laughs> you know, it's like the essence of yoga itself. I could embody all I wanted, but unless I just had cold, hard cash, uh, I was never going to be teaching yoga again. And that just made me sick to participate in. So I gave up teaching for a long time and I instead focused on, on mentoring a small handful of close friends uh, in New York, I just dumped all my energy into them, nurturing them, their careers, gave all my ideas, tons of things, just really invested in them. And then after my divorce and my canceling, you know, all those people I invested my heart and soul into evaporated as if I had not, not given them anything, 
you know, and it just really, it's like invisible gifts. The ones that I feel matter most in the world are just so disposable to people, you know, it's, it's like, they don't even see it anymore. That was like my, it, that was my experience so much in New York. The people I gave my best energy to, um, maybe it wasn't landing. I don't know. Maybe it was for the wrong reasons. Maybe, uh, they didn't need need it at the time. I don't know. But it makes you stop giving is what it does, you know. So I think of these as lunar gifts. These are gifts of the feminine aspect of our dual nature. And to try to um, visualize this, I often – think of solar energy, the masculine principle is like holding a hose above a bucket and filling it from the top down. Whereas lunar uh, feminine energy is experienced more like putting the hose in the bottom of the bucket where it fills from the bottom up. And because lunar energy is like the unconscious and our intuition is formless and it just arrives as a way of knowing. It's, it's not loud. It's not, you, you don't see it. It just, it comes into you in a way. And then, yeah, so I was going down my journey as a teacher. So I wound up moving to LA, continued to look, look for yoga teaching jobs, just looking for straight up work at that point. Dozens of auditions. I mean, it's just uh, like how, even what yoga devolved into is just so heartbreaking. You know, I auditioned in one studio. First of all, it's LA. So every job you apply to, you need a headshot, whether that's waiting tables, yoga, anything. And once I auditioned at a candlelight and hip hop themed yoga studio and the light was literally so dark when I came in to do my audition, my, my eyesight, like it took so long for my eyes to adjust it because it was so bright and then so dark and it was insane. I was literally on my hands and knees feeling around, uh, for other mats to know where to put mine. <laughs> That's just crazy. And then I, you know, another class, they were, they were the, my third time coming back to teach. I was teaching one of their community classes and they were supposed to be observing me and no one observed me. They popped their head in at, towards the end of class for two postures. And then I had a meeting afterwards about, uh, how I was making it too hard. I wasn't paying attention to the students and how I would definitely have to be supervised the next time I came in. I mean, of course, I never went back at all. I, I mean, they weren't even there watching. And honestly, it's like I, I really genuinely cared about the teaching of yoga. So, and that was not going to happen there. So I just stopped te trying to teach yoga altogether. You know, and these little disappointments, they do add up. And this is how people in midlife get so bitter and twisted. You know, you, you're like, all right, fine. I'm not going to do that anymore. All right, fine. That's the way the world is now. Well, I'm not going to bother. Okay, fine. I'm not going to do that anymore. And yeah, I mean, it sucks. I, I've been in that so many times. I don't know. You know, it's like sometimes we're dumped. Sometimes we do the dumping. But either way, I, I still don't have anywhere to take this mountain of wisdom these days. And mainly, I just keep it to my damn self. And that's where the resentful side effect, I'm feeling it. So here I am. I have to just, yeah, confess um, how, how fucking hard life has been. You know, I lost almost all of April to a really serious poison oak situation. It made me very sick. And yeah, life is just, it's just been work, work. I mean, every, everything. I wake up and I do a million things until I fall over every day. And my body is exhausted. I'm so tired and I'm alone all the time because I haven't, I'm in a new town still. I barely know anyone here. I hope it doesn't sound like I'm complaining. Um, I'm trying to, I guess commiserating might be a better word is for what I'm doing. Because I sense you're having a hard time too. Things have just been quiet and hard without much inspiration. And it's affecting my motivation to keep going. And I'm tenacious. 
little Scorpio. So if I'm like this, I can imagine, you know, that other people are also really struggling. And we're all in the soup, you guys. And, you know, no one... No one's left behind, really. You can only go as fast as the slowest person. But back to the matter at hand. If I had to say one reason that I'm breaking up with this teacher is that I want my teachers to know who I am. And this teacher didn't know I was even there. And he won't know that I'm gone. But what I want is two-way relationships in the physical world. <laughs> I don't want one-way relationships on the internet for those roles that really matter. But it's very hard because people really aren't showing up for life um, the same way, and they certainly aren't showing up with the open heart that I think is required. To, and because having an open heart is a big risk. You risk being hurt all the time. And it doesn't seem worth it, especially when the culture is as sick as ours where the destruction of someone's character is basically just a casual sport, you know. Uh, it doesn't seem worth fighting any battle because you're, you've lost before you've even started. And that's, that's the part of the culture that seems so sick to me. You know, we're all just people, people. Um... As people, they will let you down without a doubt, but they also might surprise you. And we all need each other to get to the next stage of development, to figure out what's going to be required to get over the next hill. Uh, it, because it never stops. Life keeps coming. No one gets out alive, and you can't take anything with you when you leave. So what do we do with our time here when things feel hopeless? You know, I'm, I think we'll know it in our hearts when we find the way, you know, it, I think it'll feel like a bucket feeling, filling up from the bottom. I just finished a great book called Sand Talk, How Aboriginal Thinking Can Save the World by Tyson Yunka Porta. And in it, he said that when his Anglo friends have an existential crisis and start wondering what the point of life is, you know, why all this suffering and hardship, and the answer that he says, and this, these are his words, not mine, that we are here to protect re reality from a flash mob of narcissists. <laughs> and he says that, you know, on the other side, the spirits, ancestors, angels, gods, goddesses, the entirety of the cosmos, and God itself are all there supporting us in our remembering, our to remember, to remember, piece back together who we are, which, you know, we forget when we come here because the material world is heavy and dense. But all spiritual traditions agree that the universe is powered by love. The gas and the engine of the universe is love. But this is not a soft, fuzzy, always agreeable, do whatever you say so you don't get your feelings hurt kind of love. This is a fierce, passionate, shake you out of your fucking stupidity, wake up call, giving you the hardest tests to make you the strongest, best, brightest, and most unshakable version of you kind of a love. The real love, the tough love, the love that lasts. The love which you will never experience trying to live in a safe space, I have to say. You have to step right out there with an open heart and say yes and. So I'm just sharing all this with you freely. I want to encourage you all to walk your talk longer and for further than you even think you can. I know how not easy it is, but I'm still out here on my path, and I have just a tiny grain of hope still left in my pocket, and I'm holding on to it. So I don't have like neat and tidy hour-long topics that I've arranged for you. I just have these long spooled out tangents that sometimes connect dots 
and I don't, I'm not going to teach you techniques. I'm a horrible technician. I'm not going to be your life coach. I'm going to keep being what I am, which is an artist on my path, but I'm sharing my journey with you as my offering. I'm not going to give you a product of thought. I'm going to give you a way of thinking that is going to hopefully inspire you into a way of being. And that's one of the great lessons I'm taking from a spiritual teacher that I'm breaking up with. He really helped me understand that difference between a product of thought and a way of thinking. And there's a lot of people generating a lot of products of thought that's like art. But to get the real art that will really change the culture, it's a, it's a way of thinking and being that is getting hard to find. So how you take what I give to you and make meaning of, of it is up to you. But I really encourage you to go in the world and do something, whatever it is, and do it every time you feel moved, inspired by something or someone. Acknowledge it with an offering of some kind. Pictures, words, songs, movement, rituals, letters, lawn ornaments, literally anything. If you're inspired by me and you do nothing about it, it'll never get into your bones. It's just going to rinse right through you without sticking. And without being really affected by each other and letting it in and letting it all the way in, you're never going to be able to walk the talk. You'll just be talking the talk. And words aren't imagers, and they aren't embodiment, and each has their power. You know, so just think about how you want to be in the world. And we just slowly do that more. And you might have to defend it sometimes. There's going to be a point at which you're going to be tested, and you're going to have to defend your values, what you're about, you know, and if you don't, if you pass that up, either those lessons keep coming, keep bonking you on the head, or you just stay where you are, and you don't grow, so I guess that's all I got to say on the matter, um, we actually have some episodes lined up that are, are coming. Uh, there, everyone, the other part of my team is also experiencing life happening, but they've been waiting on me actually to get to a place where I can share again. It's a, it's a real weird feeling. It's partly very depressing also, like having created as much as I have this past year and having nowhere to go with it, no one to see it. But I'll keep doing it because I don't really have a choice. I'll just be over here, y'all, if you need me. More soon. Love you. Mean it. Bye.